Welcome. Uh, it's a slightly different version of the nose today. Well, it's, no, it's the same old nose, I guess, but we're sort of in a different environs. We're down here in New Haven, which we have done a lot, but right now we're in the studios of Yale University. The reason, well, it's boring. No, it is not boring. We're, we're building a new studio, which will be opening fairly soon in New Haven, but we don't have one right now. We gave up the old one. All right, that was boring. Uh, let me tell you who's in uh, the studio with me. Lucy Gelman, editor of the Arts Paper and host of WNHH Radio's Kitchen Sink, S-Y-N-C. Sean Murray, a stand-up comedian and writer and a host of the Fantasy Film Ball podcast. Uh, and Mark Oppenheimer, editor-at-large for Tablet Magazine and host of the podcast Unorthodox, among a bunch of other stuff. Also the hardest working man in journalism, publishing everywhere all the time, pretty much. Um, like, even while I was doing the introduction, he, you know. I published four articles this right, morning. Yeah. I got to keep my dog in, in, in milk bones, you know. <laughs> it really is kind of uncanny. I mean, I don't know how you do this. And I, I work really hard, too, but I just, I look at this and I'm just. Anyway, so uh, Dave Chappelle, uh, talented. He's here, too? Yeah, he's, he's here. He's our yeah, fourth. Yeah, wow. Surprise. Good. Uh, program. Come on in, Good Dave. booking. Solid uh, booking. Yeah, come on in, Dave. No, Dave <laughs> Chappelle is uh, a, a, a very controversial and interesting comedian and a mysterious at times comedian. Uh, one of the mysterious things he's done in the last 12 months is put four different one-hour comedy specials up on Netflix. We're going to talk about two of them. The two most recent ones, Equanimity and The Bird Revelation. That'll be in the second segment, though. Here in the first segment, well, the second thing we'll talk about, I do everything backwards, is a, an advertisement for a furniture store. Although, can you even call IKEA? Furniture store it's anymore. A lifestyle. I mean, it's lifestyle something. It's like pervasive. <laughs> it's a Huga store. It's, it's the empire. Um, anyway, they've got an ad in Sweden that they want you, to, not you exactly, to urinate on. <laughs> they want somebody to urinate on it anyway. And if you do, there's fabulous, ca- fabulous cash prizes. So we've just stepped into a new world of marketing. We're you coming Ar- to that. You get an R. Kelly album, right? Well, we're going to begin w- with a piece by Ben Yagoda, who's a, been a guest on this show in the past, and a guy who writes about a lot of different things. In uh, this time, he's writing about writing in Slate about what he calls the reviewer's fallacy. The notion here essentially is that um, critics across the board, I think Ben would say, although he harps quite a bit on books and movies, critics tend to uh, dole out positive reviews rather than really digging in, rarely truly panning anything, that a lot of the uh, guideposts that you might use for making consumer-oriented decisions about what you might want to consume in terms of culture um, are a little bit misleading because I guess I guess because the critics don't have the guts to tell you that some things are really bad or that a lot of things are really bad or maybe even most things are really bad. That's one of the things that's entertained in this piece. So, uh, Lucy, you're the farthest, farthest away from me. I'll just uh, – I just want to maybe go around the table here and just sure. see what you guys made of this particular argument. Well, I am um, – you know, I, th- I think there were some concerns when we were talking um, in, in a group earlier that maybe this essay was a little bit cursory, and I do agree with that. But as a a critic of arts and culture, who's also a consumer of arts and culture, um, it it really rubs me the wrong way when critics are not critical and they don't do their jobs. And so I thought it was necessary to have some piece out there. And and that's why – and there are kind of a lot of like meta – articles about metacritical uh, writing maybe. But – but I, I think it was a good jumping off point to think about our our critics, um, of whom I'm included, of whom Mark is included, are our critics doing their jobs or are they doling out praise maybe too easily? One of the works on the essay is A Quiet Passion, the biopic about Emily Dickinson that um, if I, as a huge fan of Emily Dickinson, were writing about, I think would be quick to take to task because it's really not a very good work of art. Um, it's boring as hell, too. Yes. I mean, it's really, really one it's, of the most boring but, movies. But nothing about it is well done. You yeah. know, even to call it a cinematic masterpiece, like, okay, no, call call Mr. Turner a cinematic masterpiece, but um, but there is, there's kind of no credit due in this situation. And, and so I, I think it is good to challenge the critical world um, and and say, hey, why why aren't we doing our jobs? And how are we going to do a better job of doing our jobs going forward? Or, you know, has that moment passed? And my answer to that is, I I really hope not, because that makes me sad as a reader. I, I do want to say just quickly, when Lucy says maybe it's a little bit cursory, I, and I like Ben Yagoda a lot, and he's been on my show. He's a great guest, but like that particular movie that you're talking about, A Quiet Passion. Uh, which is this air, a suffocatingly airless movie. It's really bad. Ben has never seen it. He, yeah. He's actually pointing out the fact 
<laughs> that it's on a lot of people's top ten list. Both uh, Manola Dargis and uh, A.O. Scott of the New York Times had it on their best ten movies of the year list. And Ben has some other reason that comes to him from the ether for suspecting that they might be wrong. He's he's correct. But, like, I suffered through that damn movie, you know, and I haven't written anything about it. Uh, why does Ben need to do that without – I mean, he should watch the movie first. Sean, what did you make of this argument? I thought it was just kind of interesting that you have an article where people are complaining that critics are being too nice, where you usually hear the exact opposite. <laughs> and I think the quiet passion thing was a great um, – the fact that he never – he hadn't seen it is a great point because um, I think – a lot of the like general audiences have not seen that movie, mm-hmm. and um, so that's why he, he he mentioned in the article that he hadn't seen Moonlight either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's <laughs> just a really good movie and an yeah. interesting mm-hmm. one, not yeah. a boring one. Well, at he's all. talking about it's, it's more of a Venn diagram between critics and audiences than it is like a circle because they have different interests. And I think like you, you hear a lot of critics like talk about like superhero fatigue. Uh, mm-hmm. about like there's too many comic book movies and we're tired of them but the audiences are the exact opposite like Black Panther's gonna make a billion dollars um, <laughs> in next month because people are not tired of it so critics have different interests than general audiences so of course you're not go- you're probably gonna see I don't know anyone who's seen A Quiet Passion until I read the article I hadn't even heard of it you've just met two people well, I haven't seen it either but these two apparently <laughs> don't felt um, they had 12 they don't. had $12 too much in their pockets so. um but I don't care what's on someone else's top ten list. Well, let list. me ask you this, Sean. Um, I mean, everybody, for good or ill, and I think a lot for ill, we all use Rotten Tomatoes, right? You look at the, look at those ratings. So when you see a film with a 93 critics rating and, say, a 71 or a 68, you know, average person rating, what does that say? Do you draw a particular conclusion from that? I don't. Cause I don't. I actually almost never care about the um, the audience rating. Mm-hmm. To be honest, I look at the critics rating, and also I usually have like based on the tr- made up my mind mm-hmm. about if I want to see it before I looked at Rotten, Rotten Tomatoes. And 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 on top of that, I usually go directly to the critics I like and mm-hmm. see what they thought of it rather than go to Rotten Tomatoes because I don't care about the consensus. I was like, I, I know people. Right. I have a general feeling of what I'm gonna like based on what the people I know how they feel about things. So I'd rather go to them anyway. That, that actually is the smart way to do this, but the way most people don't anymore. But anyway, yeah. What do you Yeah, well, I mean, Roger Ebert had to go and die on me, which was a mm. shame because he was the critic who I, I mean, I thought he was so bright and so interesting and so, but also a populist and also like had, had a really, a wonderful lowbrow taste as well. And Based I always- on the movie he's made. Sorry? Based on the movie he made, I, you can- Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, and, and so it's true. And, and, and I really agreed with him a lot. And- um uh, yeah, I don't use Rotten Tomatoes either. I'm interested that you use Rotten Tomatoes, Colin. I didn't know what it was till about a year ago. I mean, oh. I, I, well, I I look at it. I still I, call the film line. Right. No, I don't. But I mean, I, in the business, it's the, there's a lot of problems with this, and, and what they've started doing is front loading is gaming I mean, the system. Well, yeah. there are some easy critics, right? right. So the, there are certain critics who are just there because they right. want to go to the screenings and stuff like this. So they get those people early and they do stuff like that. But I mean, as to Ben Yagoda's piece where he was saying, look, a lot of critics, I mean, he was pointing to the fact that there's a certain kind of book. So he starts with the the novelist Joshua Ferris, um, who uh, I do think is an overrated novelist. And, um, and, and some of the people whose opinions I respect think he's a terrific novelist. He doesn't speak to me. Um, and he said, and he looks at some of the, the blurbs that he got or some of the critical responses in, in reviews that would talk about as like splendid or perfect or extraordinary. And he was saying, look, Joshua Ferris may be a very, very competent guy, uh, but there are very few sublime or splendid or perfect books coming. Let's yeah. be honest. This isn't one. Like, let's raise our bar a little bit here and let's reserve words like sublime well, or let me ask you a question. terrific or whatever. And I, I think you would say the same thing about the Emily Dickinson movie. Let me ask you a question. As a as a critic, okay, yeah. you get assigned a book to read. Yeah. Somebody spent two and a half, three years of their life. Of their life. Writing this yes. book. Yes, yes. How... And you don't like it. Right. Uh, how willing are you to say, okay. look, this is not a good book. Don't read this book. Here's what I think the job of a critic is. I think a cr- job of, I think for me as a, as a critic writing for general audiences in places that are not highbrow, you know, it's, they're not cineast journals or, or scholarly journals, but, you know, trying to reach a public. And I think there's two things or two or three things. One, I want to write a piece that's enjoyable to read. Two, I'd like to say something about the art and craft of it for people who are fellow practitioners. But those are both smaller pieces of it than the job of connecting the work to the mm-hmm. people who would enjoy it. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'm not a superhero movie kind of person. I like to think, though, that if I go in to watch a superhero movie, I've thought about the genre enough, done enough research, talked to enough friends, and go into it with an open mind so that for people who like superhero movies, I can say, is this a good one for you? Mm. Like, does it succeed or fail on, on its own terms. And look, there is a community of people who want really airless, boring period dramas about 19th century poets. And the question is, is this a good airless, boring period drama? I mean, 
The but merchant, I want to re-ask my question. How comfortable are you saying this is really not a good book? Oh, I mean, you would say it in a much more lovely and, and well-crafted way. I'm pretty comfortable. I've, yeah. I've definitely said that about some books. I think um, sometimes you get the feeling that there's a kind of cynicism to it. Mm-hmm. Like, I, there are certain books you read and you say the author wasn't speaking from something the author wanted to say, but she or he was jumping on a bandwagon. Like, someone said, oh, these kind of books are hot. Do you, Sometimes you, you feel there's a cynicism. Like, this book isn't even the author trying her or his best. Mm-hmm. I'll also say, though, I'm more comfortable saying that about authors who have a certain degree of success. Mm -hmm. If you're rich or famous, you can take some slings and arrows. Mm -hmm. If you're just starting out and it's your first attempt, like part of my job as a critic is a responsibility to the artistic community and to the world to like support people and to say this would like there's a there's a way to say this is a really good first attempt or for a 27 year old first time director. This is really an amazing feat. Although so much so little of this is written out or spoken out the the kind of latent understandings of criticism. So, Lucy, one of the things that I was saying is, and actually I'm moderating a panel of critics tomorrow at the good speed, and and one of the things that I feel that in the theater world these days, particularly the theater world that isn't Broadway, you know, the finances are perilous the, 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 for the nonprofit regional theaters. It's, you know, it, it's – a struggle. And I think critics are less likely to really gouge something. You know, if they don't like something, I could give an example that would really make everybody, oh, okay, I will. Okay, so Adam Gopnik did a musical at the Long Wharf this year, and a lot of people like, really, really, really didn't like it. Hardly anybody wrote a pan of it. I mean, there may have been a few. There were uh, a couple. Yeah. There, there were a couple. Um, actually, Brian Slattery wrote a great yeah, that's right, of it. And Chris Arnott, um, who is one of the critics that I do read often. So I, I see a lot of theater, Colin. Mm-hmm. And I think the question that you're asking is not um, – it. You know, it's it's an important one to ask, especially are you really going to hold a community theater group that has very perilous finances up next to a different group? But I will say I have no problem – um, going to a show, especially at a place that has a donor base mm-hmm. and is maybe putting on shows because they feel that they're beholden to that donor base, I have no problem taking a show to task. Um, so I would say the last two shows I've seen at Longworth Theater were not good. And I wrote s- reviews that I thought were strong reviews that I spent time on talking about why I did not think these shows succeeded. Am I going to do the same thing for a theater company that is full of hobbyists? No. Probably if I see a show and it really does not hit any of the marks, maybe I I won't write about it at all. Or maybe I'll just have a little blip like, hey, this is a cute thing that the theater company is doing. But I think when you're talking about theaters like Long Wharf, like the Yale Rep, and even, I I will say, even like the Yale Cabaret, which is a smaller operation but has financial backing behind it Mm -hmm. and embraces a permission to fail, you have a, a, I think you have an opportunity and a duty as a critic to talk honestly about those works and what is and is not working in those works. I was laughing just because at Yale Cabaret, they just bring, keep bringing you wine at your table. So by the end, you're, you know. You're this, it. this is true. I, I will say at Yale Cabaret, I, I want to give them just the quickest of shout outs on the air because of, of all of the theater companies um, that kind of take criticism, they are – maybe the only ones in Connecticut that act like grown-ups about it mm-hmm. and um, and will process that criticism and then use it in their next mm-hmm. performance. Well, Sean, I want to go back to what you said, which I think is very smart, that, that's the, that, you know, you want – there's certain critics that you read and you sort of know who they are, you know. And, and maybe it's not just that, like, I like everything that David Edelstein likes or something, you know, but more like I know who this person is. Because it seems to me part of criticism's job is to start a conversation, not end a conversation. Mm-hmm. It's like, OK, so, you know, Frank Rich hated that play on Broadway and it's closed. It's going to close tomorrow, <laughs> you know, which is the way things have worked o- over the years. I, I'm sensing what you'd like to do is see a conversation start about something that you're interested in. Well, yeah, um, because okay, like um, I have I have there's a critic online called Film Crit Hulk. He has this persona that he's the Hulk, and he <laughs> reviews. Um, but he's a, I mean, he's he's one of the most profound. But he's not drunk Hulk. No, no, no. no that's a different one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so he's one of the most profound like film scholars I've ever come mm. across, and I go to him because he has the ability to pinpoint things about. A particular film mm-hmm. that I hadn't even recognized, like what's like something that some level of skill that I hadn't even mm-hmm. perceived before. Like he he's a big fan of the the Wachowski mm-hmm. uh, uh, Speed Racer. He pro, um, he he has like several articles on um, the the the, um, 
the website Birth Movies Dev, where he uh, he 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 breaks down why that movie mm-hmm. was panned by critics and audiences, but is actually like a, a true work of art. I go to him because I want to see like okay, if whether I missed out on something when I saw something the first time, or like why something I haven't seen is as as good and like it's beyond just like it was entertaining, but it's like it's doing something on so many levels that I didn't even recognize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I, I I agree, and I, I think there's in many cases more skill in finding and understanding something that's maybe been underappreciated mm-hmm. than there is in just you know beating the crap out of something that maybe is. You know, I should also say um, that um, you know it's it's not as if I mean some of the most profound theater experiences I've had have been low budget amateur or undergraduate or high school productions, right? I mean, mm-hmm. a really good critic, and this is actually one of Yagoda's good points, right, is that he says um, a lot of times professional critics spend way too much time on the things that matter to them as critics who see so much bad work. Mm-hmm. So if they see really interesting camera angles, like they all just, they light up, even though most people don't care about camera angles, right? I, I would take that point even further and say, like, there's a, there are a lot of things that the average consumer of culture cares about that... Um, that are perfectly within the reach of amateurs that aren't the that you don't need exquisite equipment for or that you don't even need a lot of training for. Um, yeah. Really good comic timing can pop up anywhere. Absolutely. Really good connection to the audience can pop up. I mean, the best production of, of Angels in America I ever saw was an undergraduate production mm-hmm. with basically no set, but like there was so much heart in it, and I walked out sobbing. And and was was it uneven? Sure. Was every actor in it great? No, but a few of them were. And and. You know, theater's mystical. Like it's it's not always about pulling together the most talented people and paying them, you know, the, the top dollar. So All right, no we, formula. Yeah. Right. That's right. That's we right. we probably need to switch topics here just so we get to everything. So the next topic is one where I can actually just read you the headline and we're done. Right. <laughs> the headline is the whole story. Uh, the headline <laughs> is IKEA wants you to pee on this ad. If you're pregnant, it will give you a discount on a crib. That's basically the entire story, although you have to know that it takes place in Sweden. Is there anything else you need to know? I don't think so. Um, so anyway, this, this is, uh, the ad is on some kind of treated paper that is the equivalent of a pregnancy test. Uh, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Just you know, as someone who's lived, you through, a, father of many someone who's lived through a lot of pregnancy tests. Or been, been in, in, well, how much do they cost? Do they cost a lot of money? I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, they're twenty or thirty bucks. I think it's, twenty or thirty. It's, I bucks. think. I think. I don't know. Well, you've gone through a lot of money. <laughs> they're usually bought with a lot of other groceries. I mean, it's not like you. You yeah, try you to just, bury them. You, deep. you just get one every week at this you point. You try to probably. bury them underneath the cotton bell. <laughs> and like we have milk. Do you need, do you need a pregnancy test? Can we do it? <laughs> um, Eggs. Do you, do you want me to weigh in first on that? I mean, I don't care. Yeah. Go <laughs> I mean, I. You know, um, that's weird. I'll just say that's that's weird. Um, Sweden's weird. Scandinavia's weird. Uh, they have good parental leave, but they're they're different over there. And um, uh, so you don't think this would ever happen in this country? Uh, no, anything will happen in this country. Capitalism yeah. dissolves all <laughs> morals and and decorum. Uh, of course, it'll happen. Um, but I and and I'm all for it. Like, why not? I mean, to you know, yeah, let me say this. I actually just thought of something interesting to say. Because um, I was really just thunderstruck by the whole idea, and I just I was I thought I had nothing to add, but. It's it's nice that they're treating fertility as a positive. They're basically mm-hmm. saying, "Hey, take this pregnancy test. If you're pregnant, what they give you a discount on a crib." Well, yeah, that's Sean. They're treating it as a positive because they want to sell you a crib. Yeah, yeah, right? but, but, yeah, but, yeah. But, but, but they're not treating it as a disaster, and that's a really interesting thing. And you'll see this in ads for pregnancy for home pregnancy <laughs> tests, which is there. Some of them treat it as a scary, like the look on their face when they see the blue plus or whatever is like. Yeah. Sometimes it's terror, so they don't know how to sell it. So it's right. been marketed in different ways. Sometimes it's terror. Sometimes it's like nervous but kind of tingly anticipation and sometimes it's real joy and i'm i'm glad they went all in to say that you know that this is great now it's not pregnancy is not always a happy thing for people but but i think more often than not it is well the pregnancy could be a positive but then when you like come to your senses well you just peed on a piece of paper <laughs> for a discount on a crib like you have that's, no dignity left yeah, that's, like, that's, what, that's what's fascinating about it to me is that like how, how great is this discount? Like, that you, like, <laughs> why are we peeing on paper? Like, right. There's there's a term in, in the world of kind of animal behavior, submissive urination, right? <laughs> you you have submissively urinated to Ikea because like, you I, want to see if you're eligible. I think it's like it's just a capitalistic, like, like let's see how much we can get people to demean themselves that, for, like. Do you then have to bring in the piece of paper that's yeah. been urinated on, your smelly, yeah, urine-drenched you like, piece of paper, and say 5% off the key? Yeah. Well, yeah. If, you're a, if you're a good person, you'll laminate it. And, <laughs> you know. You know what 
I want them to do. What otherwise would be the point? I don't even want the discount. I want them to come and assemble it for me. I mean, I want to, you know what I want from yeah, Ikea? Yeah, that's, that's the value. I don't want the discount right. from Ikea. I want them to assemble it. Right. Well, well, we actually, Sean and I were talking about the logistics of this, right? Because so um, – so, so first of all, like, okay, whatever. You you pee on this, you get a free pregnancy test. But if you think uh, that you may be pregnant uh, unexpectedly or joyfully, you are probably buying more than one pregnancy test. You're going to buy, like, I don't know, two or three or four or five uh, just to make sure that you are or are not pregnant, right? So that's, that's one of those things. Um, I also don't know that I would trust an Ikea crib to have, like, a tiny person – like a, a tiny human, yeah. a, my tiny human in a in an Ikea crib. But then also the logistics of peeing on a newspaper versus peeing on a stick, I think would really be hard. Like um, like peeing on a stick is, is fairly straight. It's, it's toilet friendly. Yeah. You, it's yeah. toilet friendly. Yeah. It's toilet friendly. Although people say that it's hard to aim at the little stick sometimes. Well, I guess that's what I've, the value of the I've paper been, is that it's just like yeah. you don't really have to <laughs> right, hit it. Exactly. Right, exactly. No, there's right. no bullseye. Yeah. Don't, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, well, but at the same time, we were like, what, like, what do you do? Like, do you pee in a cup and then pour the pee from the cup onto I hadn't the paper? About that. I do said, you do you pee on the whole? Where's the fun in that? I feel like it's sort of like Twister, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's sort of Feed in the right this position. is one of those days I wish you still took phone calls during the nose call. <laughs> I feel like somebody out there was recently back from Stockholm. Right. And, and you, like somewhere we would get some answers. And like peed on a piece of paper. Look, Absolutely. Look, first yeah. of all, we're borrowing Yale University studio. We could get kicked out of here for this <laughs> at, at any second. This is, we're supposed to be talking about Russian economics or something it's here. It's the home of the Milgram experiments. No, <laughs> nothing gets you right, kicked out. Right. <laughs> we, we lied to them about what the show is about. Well, did anybody have – maybe I've just become very paranoid living here in America. So, Sean, Sean I'll ask you this question. <laughs> like, I was sort of thinking, well, if I, if I have to bring the newspaper in or the paper in that I've – if I'm a woman, I've peed on, I just feel like I'm handing, da- handing data over to them. Like, I wouldn't want to, like, you know, this is like now they can collect s- <laughs> stuff about me. This huh. is the beginning of Ikea having my DNA or whatever it wants on file. I mean, that's, that's just par for the course. You know what I mean? <laughs> Everyone's data mining. I mean, at least they're kind of like a little bit more straight. I, I, just, I just love the person who's like strolling into Ikea and just slamming. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, like they came just, they didn't even, like yeah. it hasn't been a few days. They came directly, off, it's, the paper's yeah. still soggy and they just slam it down. I was like, this crib is twenty dollars less. Like it's, I don't understand. I don't understand. He, Sean's nope. right. It's par for the course. Con, I'll tell you. Let me like, the, there within five seconds after you and your partner have discovered there is a child coming, your Facebook feed is is selling, yeah. sending you to, to Kids R Us. Like right. it is, it is uncanny. I mean, they are they are paying off nurses. There are black helicopters swooping into Planned Parenthood. There is <laughs> no way you can keep the knowledge out of the hands of. Of big toys. Well, that's one. But big then, then they'll also know I'm a mutant with special powers, though, if they have my urine. Right. Well. That's my point. Anyway, I, I agree with Sean that this is something that some marketing company thought up, but the clerks never signed off on this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the poor people who are going to be receiving the soggy paper. Because who's, I mean, who's like flipping through a magazine? Like, oh, I guess I'll just see if I'm pregnant. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's a this is a decision. You know what I mean? Like, you've been thinking about this for a while. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. according to Lucy, you've already bought five pregnancies. Well, no, but I mean, I, mean, I did think it was an interesting thing because I, I was kind of speaking in disparaging terms about it because mm. I am at a point in my life where I do not see... I, I think fertility is great for mm. other people. Right. Um, but for myself, that's like not really something I'm interested in right now. But I was talking to my partner and he thought, this is great. Mark, he totally agreed with you. He was like, this is great that they are treating it as a plus and advertising to women like, oh, you have kids, it's not the end, or you're having a kid, it's not the end of the world, um, and that they're treating parenthood as something maybe to aspire to. Have you thought that Tom was trying to tell you something? Oh, he. I mean, we can talk about <laughs> that. Well, the, 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 again, the parenthood train is a different discussion. We should, we, um, people should just go out and get the magazine, like just buy like 20 of the magazine. Well, though. That's probably cheaper, it's right? It's a Swedish magazine. Right. It's probably like way cheaper to just buy the magazine yeah. and yeah, have that's that right. as your right. pregnancy but, test. You know what I mean? But right. it's also a, a ladies, it's a ladies magazine, right? Yeah. I, what, one would assume so. I th- but I think that was yeah, in was the right. article. Like, it's marketed toward women. <laughs> I do think that it's damning with Fafine Prius to say, oh, you're having a child. It's not the end of the world. Uh, however, yeah, we're, sure. this is the end of the segment. Although, you I'm, say, I'm pretty sure it's not MMA today. <laughs> <laughs> it's wooden boat. Right. Um, all right. So we have to take a little break here. We want to leave plenty of room for Mr. Chappelle. Uh, so we'll do that, and we shall be back. I'll be on you. Pee on you. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I'll pee on you. I'll pee on you. 
Sometimes the funniest thing to say is mean. You know what I mean? It's a tough position to be in. So I say a lot of mean things. But you guys got to remember, I'm not saying it to be mean. I'm saying it because it's funny. <laughs> and everything's funny till it happens to you. <laughs> but you know why I be thinking sometimes I want to stop doing comedy? And, and you know, I don't want to sound like a braggart saying this, but the real like reason I want to stop is because I'm too goddamn good at it. I'm dope, nigga. Like, no, I'm not even, I'm not even exaggerating. I'm, it's not exciting. Every night before I come out on stage, I'll be backstage like, I'm sure this is gonna go well. <laughs> and it always does. Everybody gets mad because I say these jokes. But you understand that this is the best time to say them. More now than ever. And I know there's some comedians in the back you have a responsibility to speak recklessly. Otherwise, my kids may never know what reckless talk sounds like. The joys of being wrong. I didn't come here to be right. I just came here to fuck around. As a policy, you gotta understand, I never feel bad about anything I say up here. And I, I would never admit this to you if I hadn't locked your phones up. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is from two different Dave Chappelle specials. They were both released simultaneously on Netflix at the beginning of the year. Um, one of them is called Equanimity. The other one is called The Bird Revelation. Um, they are, in fact, part more of a quartet because there were two other comedy specials released uh, earlier, uh, or actually last year, um, This, which is a lot. It's a lot of comedy specials. So I think the stand-up comedian gets to go first here. And so, I don't know, Sean... Um, I won't even ask you a specific question. I'll just let you go where, where you want to go. Okay, so I feel like I'm going to get like, kicked out of the comedy community for saying what I'm about to say. <laughs> but first of all, I think Dave Chappelle didn't need to put out four specials last year. He, he should have put out maybe – he could have combined the the, like, the content of those four specials into probably one and a half specials. Mm. And so the problem where I think with Dave Chappelle, there's a lot of backlash of the things he's saying. He's like – you know, comedians have a responsibility to speak recklessly. And it's like, they don't. They really don't. There's, a, there's, there's some part of that. But it's also like a guy like Brian Regan is one of the, like, the most he's – a, he's a huge stand-up. He's well-respected. Brian Regan doesn't speak recklessly. He's just funny. I think the responsibility of a comedian is to be funny. And um, Chappelle's super funny. I don't think his, his recent specials are an, an example of him at his best, though. I think like, he starts the special equanimity and he says, like um, – like I'm really good at comedy, and I'm, I'm I'm too good, and it's like the rest of the special. Like there's a couple of jokes, and you're like, I've heard of micers do these jokes, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And it's like, but I watch a lot of I watch a lot of comedy, you know what I mean? Just f as in like as an interest, and also as a as a stand up in like comedy rooms. But so I like I feel like a lot of it. It's not all. It's not all great. Right. Doesn't um, I just I, I don't know as much about David Dave Chappelle as I probably should or could, but doing a little bit of reading even for this, it seems as though he has also kind of a reputation for maybe showing up at a comedy club and talking for two hours. Uh, yeah, I mean, he set the record for the longest comedy. He's done like nine hours. In a, yeah. Like, <laughs> no, legitimately nine yeah, hours yeah. just straight. And, and wow. in, in those sessions, a lot of times, he will be feeling around as opposed to having any kind of tight set worked out. He'll be sort of feeling around for meaning in places well, and, where and he And you see a lot of that in the specials yeah. he released where uh, he put out four specials, but... For most of them, I think the idea that he has of himself of like I'm so good at comedy, he's going out with. I don't think he he worked those bits to the to the perfection when he no. went out on stage. He went out and he's just riffing. And Chappelle is so good. I mean, he is that good that he's able to just go out on his special and basically doing something that's relatively a new joke to him. How how is this different from the fact that real connoisseurs of certain bands they want you know they want the basement tapes of Dylan or they want you know all the live back the backlogs of the live shows of the dead released even though everyone knows for every three hours there's only one song that would make it to a greatest hits compilation. No, like, I think I, I would argue this is different. Okay, I would argue that it's different in the sense mm. that what you're seeing here is 
I mean, if you're going to enjoy these specials, and I did enjoy them, but I, I, I laughed like crazy. Yeah, I didn't have a well worked out understanding of Chappelle or that I could really contrast this work with previous work the way Sean can. But I thought some of the excitement, Lucy, was watching him try things, try things that he wasn't quite sure about, try ways of getting at something that he wasn't quite sure about. I would contrast that to the like the basement tapes or something. No, but I think it's some of the same thing. Well, I mean, I, I, it's it's that you're not it's not the tight that there's virtue in seeing them when. And it's not the tight 10 minutes. Except that those aren't, in front nine- of a, those aren't in front of an audience. These are in front of an audience where if, in fact, he doesn't get it right, live, well, he has to Take my live show example. Well, yeah, which live show. Okay. Right. okay, but so, see, Chappelle is brilliant. He's a, he's a really brilliant guy. And when he goes up on stage, he, he has an idea of himself as a profound thinker. And in a lot of, in a lot of respect, especially in his, on his show, the Chappelle show, and mm-hmm. like his older special, like Killing Him, Kill Him, Kill Him Softly, he was a profound thinker. I think in a lot of, so when you go on, on stage with uh, these, these newer specials, a lot of the ideas aren't fully worked out. But mm-hmm. to come up as like he sees himself as like a philosopher of comedy and you go up on stage and the idea is not actually like you haven't solidified What's your stance is like? I want to come see you when you have it done. Like, what's the final thought? Mm. Like yeah. the idea that you're like, I don't know, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I'm gonna just say it. And it's like, I'd rather know, I'd rather you just have a firm, funny joke than like a kind of I'm just. You, you, he spends enough time on stage riffing through stuff when he's not doing a special that he should be able to have a fully formed idea by the time he's done a special. All right. Uh, I want to get Lucy into this conversation, but before I do that, I've been reminded that I haven't reminded anybody what we're doing or who we are. <laughs> so, um, so what our, are do, we doing? We're, yeah, we're doing the notes. We're down in the beautiful Yale uh, studios here in New Haven. Uh, with me is Lucy Gelman, editor of the Arts Paper, host of WNHH Radio's Kitchen Sink, Sean Murray, stand-up comedian and writer, host of Fantasy Film Ball co- podcast, and uh, Mark Oppenheimer, editor-at-large for Tablet Magazine, host of uh, p- podcast Unorthodox, and he's published three or four things like this morning. So um, he's the hardest working man in American <laughs> journalism. But I'm off Twitter, so that, Twitter. Ups, that upped my productivity. Yeah. All right. So I'm picking up this slack. Lucy, Thank one, you. <laughs> Lucy, one thing that we haven't really talked about so far is this is also – Chappelle wading out into the waters of the current moment. And yes. in, particularly in the, spe- the second of the two specials, he really tries to formulate some ideas or some comic takes or some not so comic takes uh, on the Me Too movement. Uh, but he's stirring up all kinds of uh, trouble in these two specials. How did you evaluate how he did it? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I think I would agree with Sean in that um, – for me, one of the interesting parts about this is I actually kind of like seeing process. I like mm-hmm. watching process. And so for me, it was like, huh, this is interesting. I'm not super well versed in Dave Chappelle and his shtick. Um, but but I think for me watching, it, it was like, oh, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? Um, I actually thought some of the bits that he did about male privilege, even when he was in the first special um, – Kind of, kind of doing this weird uh, walk backwards about some of the content that he has done on uh, the trans community, and and I do find some of his work transphobic in a really problematic way. But even some of the stuff he was doing when he said, um, you know, these like like I know someone's committed when they're going to cut their member off because that is and and the unspoken bit is that is that's what male privilege looks like. I was like that. That was uh, maybe not gracefully executed, but that was funny. Mm-hmm. That was that was funny. Like I, I maybe want to see more of that. Um, I think whenever you have someone wading out into the waters of Me Too, it like it's something that I, um, as a woman who thinks about sexual assault and harassment, um, who certainly thinks about it in the media world, but the world more broadly and professionally, I want to see how it's going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will say there were points when I found listening. I, I went back last night and I kind of speed watched both after watching them an initial time. And I found it a little bit arduous um, to to think like, oh, am I going to have to sit through this whole thing, which is hence the speed watching. Um, but but I think definitely if, if you're someone who's interested in process, these are worth seeing. Let me just uh, say a, a couple of things just for the um, viewers, listeners, whatever they're called, readers, um, which is that um, the, the two stu- specials are somewhat different. Equanimity is uh, played in a large hall yeah. in Washington, D.C. It does reflect, I think, some work that he had been doing and turning over and tuning uh, a little bit over a series of concert performances. It, it is, I think, by far the tighter of the two. Uh, the second of the two, the Bird Revelation, is done in a much smaller venue. He is inches away 
from the closest members of his audience. Uh, his stuff is not as well worked out there. Um, and, and he really is, I mean, he's doing process, as Lucy would say. I mean, in a way, these things, and he's on a stool. He's he's vaping in the first one. He's smoking in the second <laughs> right. one. That seems significant somehow. I don't know why. I mean, I, I do think if, you know, if, if we want to talk specifically about wading into the waters of Me Too and trying to feel it out, um, I, I do think he sort of hits these notes of like this is what male privilege looks like in a, in a way that's interesting. And as someone who I was listening to – Do you to, mean he's critiquing it or he's unknowingly performing someone who doesn't know his own privilege? No. I, I think he's like hitting a note about it. I, I don't know if I'd go as – You mean he's commenting on it? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know that I'd go so far as to call it critique. OK. OK. Um, but, but as someone who – so yesterday I was listening to a podcast – in which uh, the host asked about the Me Too movement in regards to film. And one of the guests actually um, said, said some stuff in which there was, um, there, there was kind of some un, unknowing women shaming that maybe he didn't recognize was women shaming. And I thought, wow, I'd, I would rather go back and, and listen to Chappelle try to figure this thing out mm -hmm. than listen to someone who maybe thinks they're saying something that's okay that's really not okay. Well, Sean, the other one of the other things that he's really doing here. I mean, we know, we know that there are other comedians like Jerry Seinfeld and Chris Rock who have announced that they won't play college campuses anymore because there are too many forbidden topics. Mm. People have lost their sense of humor. There's just so many things that are third rails you can't talk about. They don't enjoy talking to that kind of audience. This is something that is that runs through both of these specials. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the first one, a little bit more than the second one, is that whole question of, you know, are, are you going to tell me? that there's a whole bunch of stuff that I can't talk about because I, Dave Chappelle, have some questions about whether you can do that or not. I mean, just react to that. I okay, guess. so I think there's a, a, a tremendous value in um, not giving in to, I don't want to go as far as to say censorship, but I guess it is censorship and saying, like, you're not allowed to talk about this thing. And mm -hmm. even, like, um, like him, him addressing, like, some of the, the trans uh, issues and the Me Too movement, I think he, I think it's, it's he's allowed to have... Um, an unsure opinion on it, but I think the the see I'm a comic I'm on the side of comedians generally, but I think also it's not that no one's saying you can't talk about it. It's saying that if you talk about this and it's not in like it's you're wrong, people are allowed to say you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Like no one's saying he cannot talk about trans people. I've seen a lot of people on Twitter um, like having arguments about. It. He's like I'm not like uh, this. There's a um, there's a music writer Craig uh, Craig Jenkins from Vulture, and he talks about how um, he said, no one's saying uh, Chappelle can't talk about being um, being trans or his experience with trans people. But it's like if you're wrong about trans people, trans people or wh whoever else is allowed to say, man, that's not ne necessarily the right opinion. You know what I mean? So you don't have to want to be in a room where people are saying like you can't say that, but people are allowed to say you can't say like w when you say like when he says comedians have the responsibility to be reckless. It's like, yeah, but people like you're reckless. You know what I mean? It's like it's against the grain. So you're going to have to face that backlash when you do that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I completely agree. And let me say something from the start, which is um, as a writer, I, I never have bought the romantic defense of artists. Like, I don't think that because I'm a writer, I get to say ridiculous things or mistreat my family or get hooked on heroin or forget <laughs> to pay my taxes. Like, I mean, you've done all those things. Those are personal choices. I've done those choices. things because, yeah, yeah. because That's I'm... That's separate from the art. Yeah, I've, I've done those things because I'm a reprobate and a fall and because of the fall from grace in the garden. But I don't um, I don't think that being an artist is an excuse. And I... I think that that artists can have, you know, frankly, bourgeois conventional habits, which include treating people well and tipping 20 percent and whatever. So I don't buy the sort of be reckless because that's, you know, that's my job. Never bought that. Um, now, that said, <clears throat> I do think that when you look at the art form of comedy and this is going back, you know, when he's smoking, I'm absolutely thinking he's smoking because Lenny Bruce smoked on. I mean, there's a tradition of certain people who go up and rather than do a tight set of joke, 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 rather than do the Neil Simon or the Seinfeld, they're doing the Mort Saul or the Lenny Bruce or frankly, the Louis C.K., which often could be much more discursive, much more storytelling. I mean, Tig Notaro works in that vein where like mm -hmm. you often are hearing a long story and you don't know where it's going. And then at the end, there's a chuckle that grows into a big grin that mm -hmm. goes into a glow, but there was never a big guffaw. So I think he's working a bit more in that vein. Do I think that out of these four hours, there was a tight 90 minutes? Yes. But I want to say one final thing, which is a lot of it also is you have to look at not the one minute slice, but the 90 minute or the four hours. So you have to look at it as a show. <clears throat> in one of his two earlier specials from last year, I think, when did the first two drop? Like um, About April? 
he has a bit about Jews, you know, and and one of it is like you can't win a complaint contest with Jews, right? Was that how it went? It was like they'll always Holocaust you. They'll always, oh yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. know, well, you know how you know. Let's try six million on for size or whatever. I mean, it, it was something about, and it was brief, but it was like you know, like I, I don't know. I mean, I could have. We, one could be up up in in arms about that, but. But here's the thing. I don't for a second think that he has a beef with Jews. I think he was mining some humor from a particular thing that we all kind of knew what he was talking about. I'm not sure that for a moment I think he's anti-trans and I don't think he's homophobic. I mean, I think if you look at the context of his work over time, I see him as a force for progressivism. And I look at the hour long special or the four hours or the career when I judge the joke here and there. It doesn't mean I would have made all his jokes. And and I think some of them are failures. But I think that's how you, the spirit in which I encounter. I think he's much more phobic or hostile towards people who are telling him he can't do this material. Yeah, and absolutely. he does ultimately do a Caitlyn Jenner joke that as far as I'm concerned is like, all right, you want to hear the joke? Right. A, tra- <coughs> a transphobic joke is really going to bother you? <laughs> he goes, well, yeah. here it is. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a lot of that. Lucy, we're running out of time here, but you know, just to sort of connect to the uh, piece that we read, the Yagoda piece we read about critics, the reviews of this have been pr- Pretty tough, particularly from critics like Jason Zinneman, who's now sort of the, you know, the Ben Brantley of comedy now for The New York Times and uh, Matt, Matt Zoller cites. Uh, and, and they've sort of complained that they've, you know, he goes too far or he crosses too many lines or there's something too transgressive about all this, you know, and, and they cite some of these, you know, very tough to listen to jokes. I don't know. What did you make of that? Or what do you make of that? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I certainly would say. Um, if you are a listener that is coming into this with sensitive ears, this is probably not not for you. <laughs> yeah, um, but but I would also say most of Dave Chappelle's of like 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 that ship sailed a, a while ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I I still think he's trying to figure something out. I, I think at the end um, of the first special, there's a, a bit about citizenship and Emmett Till, and I watched it and I thought, wow, that really didn't work. And I'm not totally sure what he was trying to do, but it was really like I I so was not expecting it. It you know it caught me by surprise. Right. I, yeah. Go ahead. Well, okay, so I think ultimately for me, it's all about how funny is it. Like, mm. if if that Caitlyn, I don't think the Caitlyn Jenner joke was a profound like breakdown. People, I've heard that kind of joke a million mm. times before. So it's like if it was like the funniest, like okay, my, one of my favorite comedians ever is Patrice O'Neill. Mm. Patrice O'Neill's views on women, um, I don't agree with most of them at all. But it's he's so funny, mm. and it's and he's and he's pointing out kind of the hypocrisy of like how we think about certain things. I was like, okay, I don't have to agree with that I think it's funny. I don't agree with the the Caitlyn Jenner. I mean, I, I just don't think the Caitlyn Jenner jokes that funny. Mm-hmm. And um, I think there's a value like what Lucy was saying before. Like, I, and Mark, you're talking about like process, like seeing process. But I, I go to a comedy club to see the process because with, by the t- like everyone, the reason comedians tour is so they can get their their hour tight. And by the time they're on um, uh, Netflix, on the Netflix, yeah. it's yeah. perfect yeah. or as close to perfect as it's going to get. Like um, in the Age of Spin, one of his earlier specials, he does this super long bit about um, about Cosby, mm-hmm. and he's like you don't know where it's going. And at the end, the joke is so funny. And it's like <laughs> he tries to do the same thing with the Emmett Till thing. He does the callback to the first joke, yeah. and it just doesn't work as well. Right. right. So I just think if it was just it was it was purely funnier, mm. it would it wouldn't even the the backlash wouldn't be there. The All right, way. we got to go to a break here, uh, so we'll have time to recommend some things to you. That's what we're going to do after this. Thanks to all the people at Yale Studios for making this work. And thanks to Skull and Bones for giving us the nuclear launch codes. That was very generous. Today's show was produced by Jonathan McPants and me, Kyone Wolf. Amanda Fish will urinate on any advertisement for $99.95. The part of Bill Curry was played by Dick Gregory. On Monday, we bring back a show about being black in America. On Tuesday, we look at another persecuted group, redheaded people. Don't call them the G word. And now, back to Colin. All right. Now it is time to uh, recommend some things. Uh, Api, why don't you go first? Oh, I have I have one I'm so excited to recommend. <laughs> okay. Now, you, Colin, I never I never tell you anything you don't know with culture because you do this for more of a living than I do. You know, I, at one point I recommended Walter Tevis. And you're like, I've read seven Walter Tevis novels. <laughs> and I thought I discovered this. That was unknown. just that one time. Right. But do you know Roger Deakin? No. Does that ring a bell? Okay. I was in England 
Do I have 90 seconds? Yeah, like, no, you, have, you have 90 seconds. I have 90 seconds. We're a little tight here. Okay. Right? I was in England uh, at a conference uh, a couple weeks ago, and I went to the, one of the, to Waterstones Books, which is one of their big chains. And it's interesting because the Venn diagrams of what they read and what we read are overlapping, but not – there's stuff that – that is huge there. I'm at the, they have a big, they always have a big nature section because the English love to walk and swim. I'm at a table and I see a book called Waterlog by a guy named Roger Deakin, who's a naturalist who decided to swim the country, basically to swim the fens and the moors and the ponds, a lot of which had been privatized during the Thatcher era and were illegal. You weren't supposed to ha- jump in them. And I just read a page and loved it, bought the book, read it. It's, it's, it's about his spending a year swimming in forbidden places in England. And it is the most magical transporting thing. He also has a moat around his own house and I came home and I said to Sid I want a moat <laughs> like some people want a dog or a fancy car or this I want a moat so Waterlog by Roger Deakin you can't have a moat in West I want a moat you know you can't have one um, <laughs> alright Sean what have you got for us uh, I just uh, finished reading The Paper Menagerie uh, by uh, Ken Liu uh, who's an amazing uh, sci-fi uh, short story writer and novelist um, it's this amazing uh Book of short stories where he, he he has the same thing with another great author, um, Ted Chang, who wrote the story that became uh, Arrival. Um, he, he they can blend these like super high concepts, like brilliant, so far past my intelligence level, like uh, sci-fi concepts, with like these really heart breaking and like human stories and i think like he tells every type so he tells stories that take place in the 17th century and he tells p- stories that take place on planets we've never discovered yet um like five centuries in the future and they they both resonate with me the same way i think he's an amazing author so the paper menagerie Mm. is a book i would recommend all right lucy what do you got i have two really quick ones the first is a podcast by nose regular actually mercy quay Mm. she's doing a new podcast called work w-e-r-k it out and this month especially it's good all the time but this month especially she's looking at uh, failure and the idea of failure and she's interviewing people who have really flopped at something or feel like they have and it is moving and funny and wonderful to hear the people she talks to. So I highly recommend that. It's on WNHH, but also you can find it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. The other um, is a, a new New Haven business called Jake's Mom's Cookies. It's uh, it's run by this woman who... Um, Jake's it's Mom, I presume. Jake's Mom, uh, <laughs> Laura Hurwitz, who um, kind of decided to completely rebuild her career um, in her 60s. She's really cool. Her latest under taking is supporting other women bakers. And so she pairs up with other women bakers from around the region to bring people things like nut-free cookies, gluten-free cookies, vegan cookies. It sounds silly. Um, She is one of the coolest people I know. And I highly recommend um, going out, you know, get a cookie, treat yourself. It's Friday. But also learn more about about Laura because she's very cool. So they sell them at Coffee and Cafe Romeo. You can also... uh, shameless plug go to the arts paper and and read about her Mm -hmm. um but she is really interesting and the website is easy to remember it's just jakesmomscookies.com but you cannot urinate on the arts paper you can or or on the cookies or on the cookies you didn't hear the first once once you bought the cookie you can do what you want with it let's be honest uh all right so um we were going to recommend this last week jacques lamar and i so i'll recommend it now and it's easy to find um sarah silverman we're since we're talking about comedians had this rather unusual encounter with uh, with a horrible troll uh who called her the absolute worst name and she just turned it around and turned it into something else I think that's all I'm going to say. If you just Google Sarah Silverman troll, you'll probably get to this pretty quickly. It turns into a long exchange on Twitter. Uh, it's remarkable. And if more things like that happen, probably the world would become a somewhat better place. Um, Her and, sister is one of the great reform rabbis. Really? Sarah Silverman's yeah. sister. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, among podcasts, I'm so late to this party that it's ridiculous. But uh, but The Daily, which is the New York Times, is my, Michael Barbaro hosts this. Of New party, Haven. Of New, of New Haven. Wow. Michael Barbaro grew up here. It, it, it is just... Just terrific. It really is just like if you if you have a podcast feed and you don't have the daily in it, you're cheating yourself. And it's it's relatively short. It takes usually some piece of the news and just analyzes it so well. It's kind of hyper produced. It's not like a raw sounding thing. Uh, anyway, really really good. The last thing I would say is. Read something or listen to something or watch something about Watergate. Watergate has so much to teach us about the present moment. If you can't think of anything else and you've got a Roku box, just box or something like that or a stick, just uh, in search, Dick Cavett's Watergate. I think Amazon Prime has this. Just a little documentary about uh, Watergate and, and Cavett's role in it. But Or read Michael Schutzen's great book. or, or listen, Man. Yeah or, yeah, or listen to Slow Burn, which is a terrific podcast. It's a new podcast. Amazon Prime. 
Prime. Prime. La Prime. All right. Thanks very much to Lucy Gelman and Sean Murray and Mark Oppenheimer. And thanks to everybody here in New Haven. So nice to us at the Yale Studios. We'll be back on Tuesday with a live show. How to set that one? A-bomb. Farmington. Yeah, 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 yeah.